Ancient Apocalypse is a series based on my work over the last 30 years. I have been an advocate for a position that is unpopular with mainstream archaeology, and that is the possibility of a forgotten episode in human prehistory, that there may be in our distant background a lost civilization. I'm not coming from nowhere with this. The idea has been around for a very long time. Most archaeologists will roll their eyes when you mention the word Atlantis. But the earliest surviving reference we have to Atlantis is in the work of the Greek philosopher Plato. The story was of a great advanced civilization that had been destroyed in an enormous flood. Uh, and that flood can be dated because Plato tells us what the Egyptian priests told Solon. When Solon asked, when was Atlantis submerged beneath the ocean? They said, oh, 9,000 years ago. That was in 600 BC. So that gives us a date in our calendar, 9,600 BC, or roughly 11,600 years ago, if you want to be exact, 11,622 years ago. It so happens that there was a massive rise in sea level at that exact date. Archaeologists accuse Plato of making the whole story up, but it's weird that he chooses a date that coincides with the latest geological evidence for what is called Meltwater Pulse 1b. It was the end of the Ice Age. Northern Europe and North America were both covered with ice caps more than a mile deep, in some cases more than two miles deep. If Atlantis is a fantasy, we have to grapple with the fact that A, it comes to us from Plato, and B, Plato gives us a date that coincides very precisely with very modern scientific information. There's a difference between history and archaeology. When you have written documents, and that's the historical period, you can be much more sure of your facts. But when you're dealing with excavations and material that has no written documents on it whatsoever, inevitably you enter into speculation about the past. And I would say a lot of archaeology's view about the past of humanity, the deep past, going back into the last ice age, is speculation, not fact. There are no documents to demonstrate it, but they've excavated certain sites, they've found certain materials, and they've drawn certain conclusions from them. And you know what? They may be right, but I think it's important that there is an alternative voice. Which is, which is offering an alternative point of view, which is looking at facts that archaeologists prefer to ignore. For example, there's a wobble on the axis of the Earth, which astronomers call precession, and it affects the timing and the positions of stars in the sky because the Earth is our viewing platform from which we observe the stars. Changes in the orientation of that platform will change the appearance of the stars in the sky. According to mainstream archaeology, precession was supposed to have been discovered by the Greeks about 2,200 years ago. But there is detailed information about precession in ancient myths going back thousands, possibly even tens of thousands of years before that. And it's, it's, it's things like that that make me feel that archaeology is not giving the whole story to the public. I'm not saying that it's a conspiracy. I'm not saying that archaeology is hiding things or covering things up. I don't think they are. I think that archaeologists work very hard. I couldn't do my own work without the work that archaeologists do. I respect them and I value what they do. But I think it's unfortunate that they've become the sole voice to interpret our past to us. This is where I find my critics very lazy and very idle. Hancock's a pseudoscientist, let's not spend any more time on him. They don't really engage or get to grips with my arguments. A lot of people are under the impression that I think aliens built the pyramids. Well, I don't think aliens built the pyramids. I don't need aliens for that. Who needs them? We, the, the possibility of a lost civilization is much more plausible and, and much, more, uh, much easier to stand up. I think that if we take the case of the Great Pyramid of Giza, which is the last surviving wonder of the ancient world and probably the most famous monument on, on Earth, I think the problem is that archaeology doesn't allow that monument to speak for itself. Why did it need to be aligned to within three sixtieths of a single degree of true north? 
I mean, really, it can be a fantastic, grandiose tomb, and it can be five degrees off true north, and nobody will notice. But to get it within three sixtieths of a degree of true north requires extraordinary effort. Why does the Great Pyramid have a, a kind of scale model of the Earth built into it? Uh, if you take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by 43,200, you get the polar radius of the Earth. If you measure the base perimeter of the Great Pyramid and multiply it by the same number, 43,200, you get the equatorial circumference of the Earth. So key dimension, not only is the Great Pyramid aligned perfectly to true north, but also it incorporates on a, on a scale of 1 to 43,200 the key dimensions of the Earth, the polar radius and the equatorial circumference. I can't accept that it's a coincidence precisely because of the scale used. It would be possible to build a, a, a giant monument uh, 580 feet high or 430 feet high, but this monument 481 feet high is that height for a particular reason and it yields that scale and that scale is derived from a key motion of the Earth itself, and that is the wobble of the Earth's axis that is called precession, which unfolds at the rate of one degree every 72 years. And the whole cycle takes 25,920 years to complete. It so happens that 43,200 is a multiple of 72. It's 600 times 72. So the Great Pyramid is a scale model of the Earth built to a scale set by the Earth itself. That, I think, goes beyond coincidence. I think at that point you begin to have to, you begin to, have to wonder what was, what was the intention and what was the level of knowledge of people who created this monument. I think it's part of the human condition to be, to be curious about the past. Um, and I do, think it, I do think it matters, particularly when it comes to the issue of a lost civilization. Because here we are today in the 21st century, a highly advanced technological civilization, feeling very secure in our own achievements and very proud of what we've done. And the present model of history and prehistory that is presented to us by archaeology allows us to feel that way because it encourages us to see ourselves as the apex and the pinnacle of human achievement. I think that this is a very dangerous position to take. I think it's important to know, are there missing chapters in our story? Particularly, is there a lost civilization in our story? A, a civilization perhaps not as advanced as ours, but much more advanced than the hunter-gatherers who are supposed to have been the only population of the Earth during the last ice age. The end of the Ice Age was an apocalyptic episode. And you can really pin it down between 12,800 years ago, 10,800 BC, and 11,600 years ago, 9,600 BC. And that's a period that geologists call the Younger Dryas. So the question, the question becomes, this cataclysmic episode of 1,200 years ago, which begins with a deep freeze and a sudden sea level rise, and which ends with a sudden warming and another sudden sea level rise, was very erosive and damaging uh, to anybody who lived along coastlines. 27 million square kilometers of the Earth's surface was flooded at the end of the Ice Age. That's roughly China and Europe and the Indian subcontinent added together. As the sea levels rise, they're smashing into these coastlines and they're pummeling and destroying everything. This was the best real estate on Earth. This is where people lived during the Ice Age. The coastlines were the best places to be. And those were the places that got massively damaged and, and, and pummeled. I don't think that archaeology is in a place to say we've got the whole past of the human race sorted out when they haven't done the work on the flooded coastlines during the Ice Age, when they haven't done the work in the Sahara Desert, and when they haven't done the work in the Amazon rainforest. There are enormous areas of our planet have barely been touched by archaeology. I'll get that little piece of dandruff off.